Well, guys, 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 eat down. Huh? Because <laughs> he's Canadian. Yeah, that should work. work. Do you want to test it? Uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Can everyone hear us online? Could someone give us a sign? Guy? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. All right. Oh, cool. Thank you. You reckon hold it against me that I said you're the eighth person down that list? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't even have to talk. I think uh, actually uh, most of the magic, if I have any uh, guy I alluded to earlier, he gives me far too much credit for it. And then uh, Ben, Professor Schneiderman, uh, basically laid out kind of some of the points that I'll make. Uh, I'll, I'll use different semantics uh, and I'll, I'll use the opposite words. but. Basically, I am uh, a little bit unusual in today's world because uh, I'm a mashup. I have 25 years of technologists, so I'm definitely a problem owner in that I help rule out and commercialize some of the emerging technology that surrounds us today, from uh, the internet to uh, mobile technology to IoT to even some defense stuff that I'm working on now. Um, but I'm a mashup because about seven years ago, I began to get focused on how this technology affects us and how what causes us to interact with the technology that we're pushing out the way we do? Why do we stare at the screens? And so I really dug deep, and uh, at best, maybe I'm, I'm a, considered to be a dilettante in a number of fields from biology, psychology, neuroscience, uh, and I'm the amateur version of Jim, but I, I went back through history to understand. Everybody kept saying we're pre wired to do certain things. So I went back to the evolutionary points in which that happened. And the work will be rolled up in a series of books that are in pre-publication now. The first two are the history of thought. Last time I gave a talk here at ASU, I brought in a million-year-old stone tool. And you might think that I'm kind of philosophical, but I'm going to end this talk with some real-world applications in my work. So what are we going to talk about? The, what we're going to talk about is the fact that today change is so fast that it's literally beyond the ability of the people who are building it to understand it. And I'm going to talk about practical implications of that. Uh, why you should care is um, if, in fact, the world is knowable, and if, in fact, we're seeking objectives that are not achievable, um, what are the flaws that happen if we do that? Even if it's just for conversational purposes, your boss wants to hear that the thing is safe, so you tell him it's safe, even though you know it's not 100% safe, but then you point out that it's a, a semantic distinction in terms of it's more safe than everything else. That might just be a conversational thing, but it might uh, hinder your ability to openly discuss and find strategies to move forward. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about, uh, yeah. there's an Irish strategy that when you're in a hurry, walk. So I'm going to go back a little bit, but I'm not going to go back millions of years. I'm going to go back to the basics of this singularity, <coughs> university, exponential age conversation that we have a lot. Um, first of all, nothing in the history of the galaxy has ever expanded continually in a linear fashion. Um, so you might call into question the fact that with singularity people talk about how robots are going to rule the world in, in 20 or 30 years. Um, is that in fact true? What's sustaining it? So let's unpack kind of the pace of change behind technology just so we're all on the same page about is it, is it a curve, is it a straight line, why is it going up forever? So traditionally the idea of, uh, of a demand curve uh, or technology maturity or adoption was some type of dip bell curve. And then uh, Foster developed, Foster and Moore developed this idea of an S-curve, looking at the kind of front end of this technology adoption uh, period. And this is what's known as an S-curve, right? Sigma. Uh, Christensen has popularized the idea of the fact that continual, and continual and innovation follows each other. And if you kind of connect these together, that's where we get this idea of continual evolution, uh, of linear kind of trajectory. So let's look at Moore's Law. The other day, I was, on Monday, I was in a presentation with a former DOD CTO who is the top, top executive of one of the world's largest technology companies. And he talked about Moore's Law. So it's clearly part of the vernacular that we use to describe this kind of ever-increasing technology. And this is what everyone pictures. We we'll talk about how there'll be uh, uh, robots are the world in 30, 40 years. But what does the data on Moore's Law actually show? Now, Moore's Law has actually been, has had a couple of iterations more than later on, some people who work in Roger. Uh, but let's just call it a doubling of chipset cost performance over two years. It's actually bounded. It's slowing down. Moore's Law is slowing down, particularly here in the United States, because we have some silicon foundry problems in the workplace. 
the idea that it's slowing down is normal because in economics we have this thing called bounded by uh, logistics function. A guy by the name of Vaclav Smeal wrote a book called Growth, where he talks about the S curve is a, a bootstrapping that occurs in the early part of, a, 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 of an organism or a civilization or a technology's adoption, where it eventually runs up against constraints in the logistics of its ecosystem. So that's an S curve. All right. So why does our time seem so chaotic right now? How is it so dizzyingly confusing if, in fact, Moore's Law is slowing down? Well, it's because it's not just Moore's Law. It's also Nathan's Laws. There's uh, transitions in software that are going on. Uh, first of all, because it's slowing down doesn't mean it's going away. We are getting chipsets out every year that are more powerful than another. So this, this S9, Samsung S9, had the, has the processing power of the world's top supercomputer in 1996. This. Uh, S10 has the processing power of the world's top supercomputer in 1997. And the S20, which I'm too poor to afford, has the processing power of the top supercomputer in 1999. Just because the rate of acceleration is slowing down doesn't mean that processing power isn't continuing to move forward. But on top of that is the fact that we also have all these other things going on. Metcalf's law. As we continue to network more things together, we have exponential network effects from that. And Fuller's Law, which ironic was that CIO, the CTO said, well, we have Moore's Law, right? All of the world's knowledge on the world today will be doubled in six months. He was conflating Moore's Law with uh, Fuller's Law. It's not actually Fuller's Law. It's called Fuller's uh, Knowledge Doubling Curve. When he wrote it in 1982, he said that knowledge on the planet doubles over 12 to 18 months. And that CIO drastically underestimated the doubling because it's now a day or less a complete amount of data on the world. So when you put all of these things together, you have this technology's rate of change, also along with uh, architectural changes called Bell's Law, uh, things like hyperscale computing, ar computing architectures. You end up with a linear progression within the computing industry, not just Moore's Law. And this is what we experience in the Silicon Valley kind of uh, singularity conversation. And when I did my work, which was trying to take technologies around us today and trace them back through history, not just decades, but hundreds and thousands and millions of years, you get a different perspective. But the singularity folks say, you're just telling me what I knew all along. This is what singularity and Kurzweil and Boston have been talking about forever. I'm not the only one. And, and uh, a guy is very kind to give me some credit for some work that I'm going to show later. But the truth is, is people have been kind of, I'm kind of stating the obvious here. I've just deconstructed it a little bit. But technology is not just computing. And when you take the time to unpack technology in a deep history, a big history of technology, you understand where it came from, you understand that te technology is not just computing. So the definitions that I use is to span from a millennial back to a lemur, consistently in, in terms of talking about technology, a little bit different than what we used in the earlier presentation. I think Jim had one that was close to me where he's uh, define technology slightly different, but he, I think it's consistent with what I'm doing here, which is the development and diffusion of techniques within and between social groups. Techniques are the tools and processes you use to achieve a desired outcome. So when you take this approach and you start to unpack what's been going on in human history, you find that we have multiple accelerating positive feedback loops between the human domains. If you improve a chipset, and that improves software, which improves medicine, which extends somebody's life, which has implications for them going back to school when they're in their 50s to pursue a different career, there's positive feedback loops here. It's not just a chipset. The, the most important and maybe pro provocative thing I'll say here is that modern technology now has more forceful impact on humanity than any other technology that I've studied, and I've studied pretty much all the major ones, certainly fire language, writing the wheel, I don't want to read my slide. I think that's a, a fairly provocative statement, but if you think about force as mass times, uh, and force equals mass times acceleration, and we look at it in terms of how quickly things like Twitter have affected political environments relative to how slowly things like the printing press had effects on political environments, I think that's a fair statement. All right. but. My point here is not just that technology is going up at a linear rate. 
it's also going sideways. So if this is a side view of today's environment, what I'm going to show you is a top view. Here you have some human domains, energy, medicine, materials, engineering, manufacturing, agriculture. Again, I'm not going to read it. The point is, is when you make a technology, a computing technology uh, progress, it has a cascade of effects here, and then each of these affects each other. Bottom line is, we're exploding exponentially, not just vertically, but sideways. Really, I, I thought it was kind of hard for people to understand yeah. because we're really talking about four dimensions here. But there's some consequences to all this technology. First of all, it's been astronomically positive for humanity. No questions about it. There's a series of books I'd recommend to anybody, but Rossman probably has the most current uh, good book called Factfulness. The reality is, is that GDP, US GDP, has had a 15-fold <coughs> increase. I'm not going to read the slide. Uh, while the rest of the world has followed. But those same kinds of gains have been in ener energy production, consumption, education. So those domains I had before, I mean, just a single one of them, agriculture. We think that agriculture represents 2% of the US population, and therefore it's no longer as important as when it represents 70% of the US population. In fact, agricultural yield per acre has gone up dramatically. At the same time, pesticide use has plummeted. So the ability to get increased yield out of agriculture, not just in the United States, but in India and China and other places, has solved a lot of the world's problems. But we don't perceive that. Deaths of, of despair in the United States have been going up. People in politics, which obviously is a completely different engine, but they're using the, uh, the uh, forums of technology, whether it's Twitter or, or, or our phones or uh, social media to kind of uh, put this message out there. America's going to hell in a handbasket. The good times were sometimes in the past. Uh, UK is going down, down, down. And the depressive use going up. Now, any one of these things we could probably unpack into changes in regulatory or, or diagnostic or, or maybe kind of thing. But taken as a whole, I think there's a really interesting story here that with the exception of increased in, uh, uh, greenhouse gases, almost every valued metric of human life on the Earth has gone up dramatically in the last 100 years. I'm talking orders of magnitude. It's been flat from thousands of years before. has gone up that much. And yet, at the same time, more technology has caused us to feel worse off. Uh, I think happiness is a little bit of a subjective metric, but I think that it's worth considering that Americans have described themselves Americans are describing themselves as very happy as a constant decline. Again, I don't want to read this. Like Chris Preble made a good tip to me earlier. But the point is, is that happiness, not just in the United States or in other developed countries, but in any place where you see technology, tends to trail down. This is what this wraps up to, to is for me. And I am going to read this slide. Uh, I'm going to make the first one as an assertion. Most of my work deals with the history of thought over thousands of years, how we evolved to think the way we do, why my body language uh, matters and what I'm talking about, how I'm interpreting yours, why I'm primarily visu visually oriented and not smell oriented. And that seems very abstract, but when you look at how our brains evolved today, and you look back at the characteristics that shaped them, the selection uh, characteristics, whether it was I did it for mating reasons, or to survive, or to find food, which is a lot of the reasons that our brains think the way they do. Every single one of those things, and there's scores of them, have changed in the last 100 years. Our brains are now archaic with respect to the evolutionary uh, selection of environments we're thinking about. So that's an assertion. I haven't talked about it proven that here today, but take, take that for a first point. Now, Guy said his problem was not as important as global ch climate change. I'm going to claim that the problem I'm going to describe to you today is absolutely more fundamental than climate change. It might be just as important, because I think what I'm describing is the root cause of global climate change. Um, what I'm describing here about the complexity of the world that we live in, how it's not understandable, is that hum how humans interact with technology is the root cause. I'm not claiming that it's bad companies with bad technologies or bad regulations. I'm saying our archaic brains 
interact with technology to like check and see if anything's here because I'm at the coffee shop and it's been 30 seconds so I'm bored so I'm going to look at my phone. This is not a dopamine thing. It arrived out of a specific evolutionary environment. That evolutionary environment has changed. We have produced new technology that is as powerful as a magic wand and we don't know how to use it. So because we use the brain in outmoded ways with new technologies, we create a number of the problems that are around us today. This is too complex to understand. This is not a theoretical argument. In the real world, I'm involved with multiple billion dollar projects right now. And the people on the projects are some of the brightest people I know. They don't have a clue. And I know that's kind of a harsh statement, but I think that's really important. And the reason why is no one is incented to look at, I wish Jim was around because I wish he could maybe pump some holes in this, to understand the problems that I'm describing to you. We're all too busy worrying about COVID and the polar ice caps and straws. I still don't understand the problem with straws. But we have catastrophe fatigue from dealing with the symptoms of this complexity of information overload that we've all experienced in multiple domains of human life. And no one has an incentive to look at it because you have to be sort of weird like me to look at all these pieces to even sense it, I believe. The irony is, is that as a result of all of this rapid change is we're far better off than we perceive as worse off. So what happens when more change comes? Are we going to be that much worse off? All right, so this is the chart that uh, a guy referred to. Uh, I think this is slightly different than what other people have done, but I want to point out that technology changes happened in the past. Uh, it has had a positive effect on co cognition, at least over the last 100 years. Uh, there's demonstrated uh, uh, talks about how uh, IQ has improved, not just through better books or, or education, but also through food and these other domains that I talked about. And, and clearly, there's been some effect on, on politics business. But in the past, po uh, politics managed business, which managed social change or tried to, and then all this stuff occurred down here. People would create something, they would understand it. This was all understandable. These were human-driven systems. We controlled it, and they sustained human, human cognition. This is where technology is going. Technology is a compute, but again, remember, it's moving both uh, vertically and laterally. So it's only represented in two dimensions here. I think cognition will follow. This is an average, and as Katina and I talked about before, it's really important to talk about who's benefiting the most and who's not benefiting the most and why is this average going up. But I think on net there'll be more winners rather than losers. But what I think is going to happen is that social change, business, they're, they're going to have to follow. They're going to have to adapt. Earlier, Ben and uh, Guy were kind of talking, and it seemed like Guy was thinking that uh, politics needed to control something. And Ben was like, well, does it really? And this is where I push back gently on, on, on Guy and say, look, I can expect politics to adapt and there's certain things that you want the French government to do or the U.S. government to do, but there's other things that maybe the solution happens among individuals and social groups and it trickles down. There's some really good uh, books out there. I think New Power kind of categorizes the idea that social change can then inform it and construct opportunities to inflect up these, these curves. So I think that these are actually uh, curves that you can use when thinking about where we look for the source of a solution to a problem. So, again, I don't want to read this slide. Everything is going to change. You cannot change the economics around computing and technology and connectivity and then have that cascade into medicine and have that medicine cause us to live longer and have geriatric people have to redefine their educational skill sets in a world in which everything we know, what does it mean to be married? What does it mean to be work? I, I do work on the future of work. I do work on the future of manufacturing. Clearly, do work on the future of thought. I'm telling you, fundamental th change is afoot, and it's going to speed up. It's already not controlled or understood. Uh, I think that this affects everybody. Uh, interestingly enough, the lower income and less well educated, I think, receive an outsourced, an outsized, and disproportionate uh, percentage of the of the, the ills of technology. I think there's specific prescriptions there. But again, it's what people are doing that matter. It's not that technology was launched. I'm launching lots of new technology. It's not the technology's fault. It's the fact that we launch it. If it's successful, it means it's because people bought it. 
It's the market demand that drives the technology. And there are lots of great technology that does amazing things that gets launched and nobody uses it. If it doesn't get used, it dies. The technology that's around us today is there because people wanted it and used it. But if you don't think that's the root cause, uh, Guy, uh, you know, as you talk to, as you seek regulation, uh, I would say think about who's adopting the technologies that you described to try and find where the sources should lie, where the sources of the problem could be. So this is another point I was going to ask Jim about, because most of the defense work I do, I did a talk to NATO recently, and I told them that they're thinking wrong about the future because the fabric of civilization is being re-rendered. They have in their mind, when I ask them, what are you protecting? I, I ask them all these questions, who are you, you know, these things that they're comfortable with are changing, who, who's attacking them is changing, and how they're being attacked is changing, and, and what they're defending themselves with will, ch will change. But they don't understand this. When I say, what are you protecting? Well, I'm protecting American homeland. Well, not really, because in cyberspace and other operations, we're not doing that anymore. It's virtual ones. Well, I'm protecting American ideals, but American ideals are, we have weaponized technology against ourselves, and we are trans rapidly transforming what our American ideals are. I mean, we, uh, 100 years ago, gay marriage was a kind of crazy idea, and equal human rights was, was, was equally preposterous. All of those things have changed. So what we're protecting is rapidly evolving. So in a world of which all these things are going on, we're post-security, post-understanding, and post-certainty. That's the kind of picture I'm trying to paint as a backdrop before I get into some uh, real-world examples. So when I see live, we'll say, trustworthy systems. By the way, I think, Ben, uh, if you're still on, uh, you and I traded a, a note beforehand. I was afraid my points would undermine yours. I, I think we're on common ground. We're looking at the same coin from both sides, whereas uh, Giordano said with about 20 IQ points over me, Janusi, we're looking at the same thing from both sides. But, but I pause anytime I hear that because someone's saying something is fixed and objective in a world in which it can't possibly be. In books like this, I'm sure we all have these kinds of books on our, our show. Uh, blockchain's going to keep our data safe, so I'll, I'll go there, I'll buy their product because it's safe. Here's legislative. legislation that's pending in one of my worlds, uh, 5G. We're going to secure and protect fifth generation networks. Um, I'm reading a lot of 5G stuff right now. It, you can't say that. It's not true. So let me give you some examples. Right now, one of the projects I'm working on is Department of Defense, fully network command and control battlefield. The idea that everything on the battlefield will talk to each other. Now, if you've ever used military radios, you'll realize what a leap that is for the torpedo to be talking to the soldier's rifle, to be talking to that person's, uh, what did you call it, uh, the uh, the black box for the soldier, the fighter? Fight, fight recorder. Fight, fight recorder. The idea that all these things are talking to each other. Now, this problem is immensely complex, but the problem is the people staffed to work on it have 18 month billets where they get up to speed and they have to accomplish certain things by the time they leave. So they have to carve off pieces of the elephant to eat one bite at a time. There's cultural constraints around the problem. They say things like the warfighter will be fully connected digitally and empowered and able to be as effective connected as disconnected. Now, wait a minute. If I'm going to be as effective connected to disconnected, why am I going to spend a trillion dollars to connect everything? Now, what this should have said is, but also practical and effectively uh, you know, engaged in the war when they're disconnected. Now, we can tweak that, but the culture and the complexity of the problem results in the wrong kinds of answers. You know, we want to fix an ad hoc networks with security. No. No, there's plenty of times we don't need security. But the mindset that everything has to be secure uh, prohibits us from looking for solutions that would be available to us if we weren't seeking things that are really, really impossible to do. So to secure this would be so complicated that it's better that we don't even have this at all rather than have it be secure. Several Fortune 100 companies are working to astronomically increase the amount of broadband to the homes of America. Uh, they've asked me to draft a vision of how that would affect adjacent industries. And I went further to talk about how it would affect cultural constructs, work, family, home, education. 
Uh, this work is ongoing right now. But the point is, who's qualified to, to, to do that? Certainly not me. I've got to reach out to a bunch of other friends. But I mean, I've got a good sense of this, but I start with the basic that I can't understand. I start with the understanding that the feedback loop of, if I just created 100 times more bandwidth to the, to the US home, means that everybody else is planning five years from now for there to be five times more broadband is about to be blindsided. It's a you know, three-legged race where we've just taken one leg and just shot it out a 1,000 miles ahead. So this is a project I'm working on today. And if I keep in mind the wisdom of insecurity that I can't possibly understand this because I'm going to predict how people who don't see this coming are going to react when they get blindsided by it, uh, there's, there's real implications here. Another project I'm working on today, this is a platform in the intelligence community. It can consume every bit of data in the world today, in real time. It can consume all social media, all uh, communications, ICT, down to the level, I mean, all the dark web uh, conversations, certainly anything published on the web, down to the level of NOAA weather buoys. And against this, we can then start to query information that we want out of it what I call an emission technology. Now let's apply that to the commercial sector. Guy, you're going to love this. Right? This is the black box in, uh, in Jim's, uh, Jim's deck. But this is the black box on godlike scale. So if you were going to apply this outside of the classified you know, environment to commercial, where, where would you go? How would they use it? What would be the unintended consequences of it? This is stuff that I work on today. So you can see how I say that this is the wisdom of insecurity. If somebody says we're going to use this with any type of certainty, they combine this with the broadband project, right? Last one, 5G globalization. Um, so I'm, I come out of telecom, and one of the projects I'm working on is 5G. All the different um, US agencies have been calling me with different parts of the elephant related to 5G. Finally, we got them all together, and we're coordinating alongside industry how to deploy 5G as a competitive response to Huawei. What's wrong with if Huawei supplies 5G to the world? Well, trying to develop that picture is a really complex thing. So you need multiple stakeholders, you have unknowns on the business case side, you have unknowns in terms of how well people are going to play the game. I'm not saying the world is like impossible and none of this will work, but I'm saying that when you think about the pace of change, not just within technology, but across all these different human domains, and you apply that in real world uh, situations where people are spending real money, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, this is how it plays out. And if you go into that with a sense of certainty and confidence, you're working off of an inaccurate view of the world. You're pursuing things that can't be pursued. I think it cuts you off from seeing solutions. But you will succeed. Why? Because you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than the slowest person in your group. So if you're not moving at the same speed of technology, nobody knows that. What they know is you seem to be moving a little bit faster than your competitor. So if you talk about things that can't be achieved, everybody's happy and you look more successful than everybody else. You do this because the people around you don't have time to come to meetings like this and don't have time to listen to Jim and listen to me and talk about how complicated things are. They're worried about COVID. They're worried about uh, their kids. They're worried about job. They're worried about taking time away from you know lesson plans. And, and they just don't have time for all this. Um, the incentive structures aren't there, right? I mean, there's limited incentive structures for you to stick within your, your specialization such that you get tenure and that you move to a point in which you know, you, you've established preeminence. Um, but to work as a generalist, to be talking about the sky is falling in an area in which nobody's willing to hear about, nobody wants you to talk about, I'll give you an example, artificial intelligence, autonomous cars. If somebody said, is this car safe? You can say, yes, it's safe. It's the safest car in the market. Or you could say, this car was extraordinarily safe when we sold it, except for some problems that we patched a month ago over the air, but we don't know about the unintended consequences of that. So that's the reality, but you can't talk like that because customers won't buy that car. Now, if you said this car autonomously has had a thousand times less crashes per driven mile, 
than a regular car. Is a regular car, car driven by me or my teenager safe? No, it's not. Neither are these things. So pursuing safe isn't necessarily the right objective. Uh, but the other thing is, is if you start talking about this, you're part of the problem. Because you're making people stressed, and they don't want to hear about stress. They want solutions. Give me the tweet of how I'll solve this. So I'm going to leave you with this, the wisdom of, of insecurity. And this is where I think Ben and I are, aren't very far off. I'm not saying he's wrong by saying uh, there will be a, I had to write it down. Reliability, safety, and trustworthy. I think he's saying those are aspirational goals and you're moving towards those. And I think he would agree, agree with what I'm basically describing as an empirical approach as opposed to a rational approach. But I think the semantics matter when you start to say, let's not strive for a secure battlefield. Let's strive for an effective battlefield. Let's use information in a complex environment uh, differently, leads to different tactics. So for example, you don't spend a billion dollars, even if you're the US government. You spend $10 million. You approach things iteratively with MVPs, minimally viable products. You get market feedback. You do sensing. Collaboration. Earlier, somebody was talking about the importance, and it may have been you, uh, yeah. about uh, diversity. Yeah. This is where seeking to put yourself in the enemy's shoes, not from a combative perspective, but from a hearts and minds perspective. Why are they willing to die or have their kid die to beat you? Once you start to understand this and put those people on your team, you can create better, more holistic problems than if you think you're red teaming the bad guy. Really understand that. Um, so security is uncertainty and RST are all worthy, but I look for things like anti-fragile. I put this in here and somebody gave me a hard time. Well, somebody warned me not to say this, but I think COVID-19 is one of the best things that's happened to Americans in a long time. Listen, do you know what anti-fragile is? When you get stressed, you're better off. COVID-19, highly viral, very low mortality. All of us are getting a wake-up call that our, you know, Ancestors have had many, many times. Stock up, be prepared, you know, wash your hands. I mean, people put culture and society ahead of personal interests for a long time. Now I'm questioning whether or not I don't want to go to the inconvenience of going to Starbucks and I have to make coffee at home. That's a personal interest above collective interest. It's a reframing of the American system, but we're also getting logistics and supply chains. There's going to be a rash of new doors. I guarantee it. When you go out the bathroom, there'll be a door at the bottom, a door knob, and you just click with your foot, and the door's going to open. We're going to be more resilient so that the next time something comes along that's much more, uh, uh, I don't want to say virulent, but higher mortality, uh, we'll have been prepared behaviorally, supply chain, etc. You definitely don't want to be quoted out of the context. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I, but, but, but you have, this is what you have to do when you want to say, the world is more complex than we are. I'm basically done, I'll just finish up. Uh, and, and I know that that's kind of a provocative point, but, but this is the point. We have to be humble, we have to be multidisciplinary, we have to be multicultural. We have to say, this is a whole new world. And this is important, and this is where I would kind of reframe the Ben Guy conversation at the end is, I don't want to look at the end user as some helpless victim here. I see the end user as part of the solution. They are the person who knows the most about what's going on, how it affects them. And across a million users, we might find five people doing things right that become the way to inform the solution for the social group, for the, for the corporation, and for the, 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 the national body. So the idea that, will a million people agree on the, on the right thing? No, but they are a laboratory from which we can learn. And I think I'm pretty much done.